art making predominantly for me is about learning. And I learn more about these sort of layers of history that uh, relate to you know, this place, to the South Island of New Zealand, to this area, perhaps it might be Canterbury, or uh, and there might even be close relationships that are more interconnected with you know, whānau connections. So most of the time, it's really exciting. <laughs> It's, it's really amazing and it's actually a real privilege. I didn't grow up in the Ngaitahu Takiwa. I actually grew up in Northland. But the relationships to Ngaitahu were very strong. And they were very strong because uh, my, my grandparents, my tawa and my pawa, who uh, they were school teachers in the far north, kept um, those relationships alive for my generation. My partner and I came down to the South Island to live because this is, you know, my Turanga Waiwai. So we came down here to see how living here would actually manifest in my practice and in my art form. You know, jewellery is usually about displays of wealth and it's really about status. But her work is not just about that. It's not just ornamentation or decoration. There's a deeper dimension to her practice, which I think where the conceptual stuff comes in. So she's, you know, she's a conceptual artist who makes jewellery. Areta's work at one level is an attractive piece of jewellery or uh, it's something which uh, speaks to her, um, her, her skills as, a, as an artist, but really what um, is being told there is that pithy message which is captured in the image. And it's only if you understand or take the time to contemplate or engage with the artist that you understand how, how deep the story is behind it. Museums have played a huge role in my practice. Uh, so we're, we're really fortunate that our tūpuna have actually uh, held this material for us and looked after it for us. And there are still some of these um, early visual forms that we can reference as artists and as uh, people today. So this is a really early piece of Ardita's and this is her label series and as you can see one's made of pawa, one is wood and one is perspex. So instead of casting the tiki or the other things that were in the collection, she decided she was going to work with the labels that were attached to the taonga that were in the collection. Our taonga has kind of been detribalised and put in museums and categorised in a particular way, a museum way, and kind of the removal of kind of that history and a new history kind of added to it. And also the idea of numbers and how we all have a number or a label or a, yeah. So, I mean, she's a clever, clever, clever. We were both at the University of Cambridge at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and we took a tiki which is provenanced to Cheviot, North Canterbury, and placed it on the blueprint paper and exposed it to light and then developed the paper and we got this image which is a shadow image and bingo, um, that was what, it, what produced the thing that we were looking for. Suddenly, this space, this conceptual idea sparked something. It wasn't necessarily a thing yet. It might have been just like a vibration. And the idea kind of grows. And there might be some experimentation. And then there's kind of an aha moment, you know. And you, it's this process kind of flows. <laughs> We know that with Taonga, that whakapapa or provenance sort of increases when we know the stories, um, when our ancestors have not only made but handled these objects and handed them down. So it was 
bringing sort of touch into the equation, the taonga is also making the image with us. So it's sort of conceptually, it's really, really potent. And uh, from a Māori world view, we can also agree that maybe something has transferred from the original object into this work. What might register as a positive form is actually an absence. That's really interesting because it's that absence that is actually inspiring something in me. That absence allows me I know, a space to be creative and innovative. And certainly by the end of my journey, I really understood that Modi could be a creative thing. You know, she's cast from the photograms as opposed to casting from the objects. It's like one step removed, if you know what I mean. So it's a cousin rather than a brother or a sister. Naito, who used to use heat to change the colour of Pōnamu. So she applied that kind of logic and that methodology to the materials that she was working with. I think conceptually they're fantastic. It pushes what jewellery is and isn't as well. They are new forms of old symbols. Shark's teeth, scallop shells, fish hooks. Actually, we know these things, but maybe we haven't been thinking about those things as um, symbols of naitahitanga. So it's kind of, sometimes the artist's job is to bring those symbols back out into the light again. She's not just mimicking or remaking something that already exists. She's actually adding to the conversation. And that's why she's kind of genius, I think because she, her ability to think about things quite laterally. And as I said, in time, people will regard her work, I'm sure, as taonga. I mean, they probably do now. Hini ahua, he kura ahu i tione, he kura aho ki tione. A treasure drawn from the soil a treasure connecting to the soil. Um, she kind of represents quite a life-changing practice, sort of enhancing experience. A six-year investigation that has actually resulted in new forms that I didn't dream of a wee while, 10 years ago, um, that have enhanced my knowledge as a Ngaitahu person and as a Ngaitahu artist. So she is very symbolic. I think that really is a big part of Aretha's work, that, that it's actually about her and her family and her identity. She's giving away lots of her in each thing that she does. I mean, this is a lifetime's work, kind of unravelling understanding more about Whakapapa and um, the, the, the relationships and the interconnections. It will be a continuing theme. There's lots, lots to learn.